Lucille Desiree Ball August 6, 1911, to April 26, 1989, was an American actress, comedian, model, entertainment studio executive, and producer. She was the star of the self-produced sitcoms I Love Lucy, The Lucy Show, Here's Lucy, and Life with Lucy, as well as comedy television specials aired under the title The Lucy Daisy Comedy Hour. Ball's career began in 1929 when she landed work as a model. Shortly thereafter, she began her performing career on Broadway using the stage names Diane Belmont and Diane Belmont. She later appeared in several minor film roles in the 1930s and 1940s as a contract player for RKO Radio Pictures, being cast as a chorus girl or in similar roles. During this time, she met Cuban bandleader Daisy Arnaz, and the two eloped in November 1940. In the 1950s, Ball ventured into television. In 1951, she and Arnez created the sitcom I Love Lucy, a series that became one of the most beloved programs in television history. The same year, Ball gave birth to their first child, Lucy Arnez, followed by Daisy Arnez Jr. in 1953. Ball and Arnez divorced in May 1960, and she married comedian Gary Morton in 1961. Following the end of I Love Lucy, Ball would go on to appear in a Broadway musical, Wildcat, for a year from 1960 to 1961, although the show received lukewarm reviews and had to be shut down permanently when Ball became ill for a brief time. After Wildcat, Ball reunited with I Love Lucy co-star Vivian Vance for the aforementioned Lucy show, which Vance departed in 1965 but which was to continue for three years with longtime friend of Ball's Gail Gordon who already had a recurring role on the program. In 1962, Ball became the first woman to run a major television studio, Desilu Productions, which produced many popular television series, including Mission, Impossible and Star Trek. Ball did not back away from acting completely. She appeared in film and television roles for the rest of her career until her death in April 1989 from an abdominal aortic dissection at the age of 77. In 1985, Ball took on a dramatic role in a television film, Stone Pillow. The next year, she starred in Life with Lucy, which was, unlike her other sitcoms, not well received. The show was cancelled after three months. Ball was nominated for 13 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning four times. In 1977, Ball was among the first recipients of the Women in Film Crystal Award. She was the recipient of the Golden Globe Cecil B. DeMille Award in 1979, inducted into the Television Hall of Fame in 1984, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Kennedy Center Honors in 1986, and the Governor's Award from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences in 1989. Early life Born at 69 Stewart Avenue, Jamestown, New York, Lucille Desiree Ball was the daughter of Henry Durrell Ball (1887–1915) and Desiree Dee Dee Evelyn Ball (née Hunt) (1892–1977). Her family lived in Wyandotte, Michigan, for a time. She sometimes later claimed that she had been born in Butte, Montana, where her grandparents had lived. A number of magazines reported inaccurately that she had decided that Montana was a more romantic place to be born than New York and repeated a fantasy of a Western childhood. However her father had moved the family to Anaconda, Montana for his work, where they lived briefly, among other places, her family belonged to the Baptist Church. Her ancestors were mostly English, but a few were Scottish, French, and Irish. Some were among the earliest settlers in the Thirteen Colonies, including Elder John Crandall of Westerly, Rhode Island, and Edmund Rice, an early emigrant from England to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. When Lucille was three years old, her 27-year-old father died of typhoid fever. Henry Ball was a lineman for Bell Telephone Company and was frequently transferred. The family had moved from Jamestown to Anaconda, Montana, and later to Trenton, New Jersey. Her father contracted typhoid and died in February 1915 while Dee Dee Ball was pregnant with her second child, Frederick. Lucille Ball recalled little from the day her father died, but remembered a bird getting trapped in the house. From that day forward, she suffered from ornithophobia. After Ball's father died, her mother returned to New York. Ball and her brother, Fred Henry Ball 1915 were raised by their mother and maternal grandparents in Celeron, New York, a summer resort village on Lake Chautauqua, 2.5 miles west of downtown Jamestown. Lucy loved Celeron Park, one of the best amusement areas in the United States at that time. 
Its boardwalk had a ramp to the lake that served as a children's slide, the pier ballroom, a roller coaster, a bandstand, and a stage where vaudeville concerts and regular theatrical shows were presented which made Celeron Park a popular resort. Four years after Henry Ball's death, Dee Dee Ball married Edward Peterson. While her mother and stepfather looked for work in another city, Peterson's parents cared for her and her brother. Ball's step-grandparents were a puritanical Swedish couple who banished all mirrors from the house except one over the bathroom sink. When the young Ball was caught admiring herself in it, she was severely chastised for being vain. This period of time affected Ball so deeply that, in later life, she claimed that it lasted seven or eight years. Peterson was a Shriner. When his organization needed female entertainers for the chorus line of their next show, he encouraged his 12-year-old stepdaughter to audition. While Ball was on stage, she realized performing was a great way to gain praise and recognition. Her appetite for recognition was awakened at an early age. In 1927, her family suffered misfortune. Their house and furnishings were lost to settle a financial legal judgment after a neighborhood boy was accidentally shot and paralyzed by someone target shooting in their yard under the supervision of Ball's grandfather. The family subsequently moved into a small apartment in Jamestown. Topic. Career Topic. Early career In 1925, Ball, then only 14, started dating Johnny DeVita, a 21-year-old local hoodlum. Dee Dee was unhappy with the relationship, but unable to influence her daughter to end it. She expected the romance to burn out after a few weeks, but that did not happen. After about a year, Dee Dee tried to separate them by exploiting Lucille's desire to be in show business. Despite the family's meager finances, she arranged for Lucille to attend the John Murray Anderson School for the Dramatic Arts, in New York City, where Betty Davis was a fellow student. Ball later said about that time in her life, All I learned in drama school was how to be frightened. Ball's instructors felt she would not be successful in the entertainment business, and were not afraid to say this to her face. In the face of this harsh criticism, Ball was determined to prove her teachers wrong and returned to New York City in 1928. That same year, she began working for Hattie Carnegie as an in-house model. Carnegie ordered Ball to dye her then brown hair blonde, and Ball complied. Of this time in her life, Ball said, Hattie taught me how to slouch properly in a $1,000 hand-sewn sequin dress and how to wear a $40,000 sable coat as casually as rabbit. Ball's career was thriving when she became ill with rheumatoid arthritis and was unable to work for two years. In 1932, she moved back to New York City to resume her pursuit of an acting career and supported herself again by working for Carnegie and as the Chesterfield Cigarette Girl. Using the name Diane, sometimes spelled Diane Belmont, she started getting chorus work on Broadway, but it was not lasting. Ball was hired, but then quickly fired, by theater impresario Earl Carroll, from his vanities, and by Florence Ziegfeld, from a touring company of Rio Rita. <laughs> Hollywood After an uncredited stint as a Goldwyn girl in Roman Scandals 1933, starring Eddie Cantor and Gloria Stewart, Ball moved permanently to Hollywood to appear in films. She had many small movie roles in the 1930s as a contract player for RKO Radio Pictures, including a two-reel comedy short with The Three Stooges Three Little Pigskins, 1934, and a movie with the Marx Brothers Room Service, 1938. She also appeared as one of the featured models in the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers film Roberta 1935, as the Flower Girl in Top Hat 1935, and in a brief supporting role at the beginning of Follow the Fleet 1936, another Astaire Rogers film. Ball and Ginger Rogers, who were distant maternal cousins, played aspiring actresses in the film Stage Door 1937. .In 1936, she landed the role she hoped would lead her to Broadway, in the Bartlett Cormack play Hey Diddle Diddle, a comedy set in a duplex apartment in Hollywood. The play premiered in Princeton, New Jersey, on January 21, 1937, with Ball playing the part of Julie Tucker. One of three roommates coping with neurotic directors, confused executives, and grasping stars, who interfere with the girl's ability to get ahead. The play received good reviews, but problems existed, chiefly with its star, Conway Torrell, who was in poor health. 
Cormac wanted to replace him, but the producer, Anne Nichols, said the fault lay with the character and insisted that the part needed to be reshaped and rewritten. The two were unable to agree on a solution. The play was scheduled to open on Broadway at the Vanderbilt Theater, but closed after one week in Washington, D.C., when Torrell suddenly became gravely ill. Ball later auditioned for the role of Scarlett O'Hara for Gone with the Wind 1939, but Vivian Lee got the part, winning an Academy Award for Best Actress for her role. Ball signed with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer in the 1940s, but never achieved major stardom there. She was known in Hollywood circles as Queen of the Bees, a title previously held by Faye Ray, starring in a number of B-movies, such as Five Came Back 1939. Like many budding actresses, Ball picked up radio work to supplement her income and gain exposure. In 1937, she appeared regularly on The Phil Baker Show. When its run ended in 1938, Ball joined the cast of The Wonder Show starring Jack Haley best remembered as the Tin Woodman in The Wizard of Oz, 1939. There began her 50-year professional relationship with the show's announcer, Gail Gordon. The Wonder Show lasted one season, with the final episode airing on April 7, 1939. MGM producer Arthur Freed purchased the Broadway hit musical play Dewberry Was a Lady 1943, especially for Anne Southern, but when she turned down the part, that plum role went to Ball, Southern's real-life best friend. In 1946, Ball starred in Lover Come Back. In 1947, she appeared in the murder mystery Lurt as Sandra Carpenter, a taxi dancer in London. Topic. I Love Lucy and Daisy In 1948, Ball was cast as Liz Cooper at first, Cougat. This was changed because listeners were getting the characters confused with a real-life bandleader, Xavier Cougat, a wacky wife. In My Favorite Husband, an audio program for CBS Radio, the show was successful, and CBS asked her to develop it for television. She agreed, but insisted on working with her real-life husband, Cuban bandleader Daisy Arnaz. CBS executives were reluctant, thinking the public would not accept an all-American redhead and a Cuban as a couple. CBS was initially unimpressed with the pilot episode, produced by the couple's Desilu Productions Company. The pair went on the road with a vaudeville act, in which Lucy played the zany housewife, wanting to get into Arnaz's show. Given the great success of the tour, CBS put I Love Lucy into their lineup. I Love Lucy was not only a star vehicle for Lucille Ball, but also a potential means for her to salvage her marriage to Arnez. Their relationship had become badly strained, in part because of their hectic performing schedules, which often kept them apart, but mostly due to Desi's attraction to other women. Along the way, Ball created a television dynasty and achieved several firsts. She was the first woman to head a TV production company, Desilu, which she had formed with Arnez. After their divorce, she bought out his share and became a very actively engaged studio head. Desilu and I Love Lucy pioneered a number of methods still in use in TV production today, such as filming before a live studio audience with a number of cameras, and distinct sets, adjacent to each other. During this time, Ball taught a 32-week comedy workshop at the Brandeis Barden Institute. She was quoted as saying, You cannot teach someone comedy, either they have it or they don't. During the run of I Love Lucy, Ball and Arnez wanted to remain in their Los Angeles home, but time zone logistics made that difficult. Since prime time in LA was too late at night on the East Coast to air a major network series, filming in California would have meant giving most of the TV audience an inferior kinescope picture, and, at least, a day later, sponsor Philip Morris did not want to show day-old kinescopes to major East Coast markets, nor did they want to pay the extra cost that filming, processing, and editing would require. So, the company pressured Ball and Arnez to relocate to New York City. The couple offered to take a pay cut to finance filming, on the condition that Desilu would retain the rights of each episode once it aired. CBS agreed to relinquish the post-first broadcast rights to Desilu, not realizing they were giving up a valuable and enduring asset. In 1957, CBS bought back the rights for $1 million $8.71 million in today's terms, providing Ball and Arnaz's down payment for the purchase of the former RKO Pictures Studios, which they turned into Desilu Studios. I Love Lucy dominated U.S. ratings for most of its run. An attempt was also made, with the same cast and writers, to adapt the show for radio. The pilot adapted the famous, Breaking the Lease, 
episode, in which the Ricardos and Mertzes argue, and the Ricardos threaten to move, but find themselves stuck in a firm lease. The resulting radio audition disc has survived, but never aired, a scene in which Lucy and Ricky practice the tango, in the episode, Lucy Does the Tango, evoked the longest recorded studio audience laugh in the history of the show, so long that the sound editor had to cut that section of the soundtrack in half. During the show's production breaks, Lucy and Daisy starred together in two feature films, The Long, Long Trailer 1954, and Forever, Darling 1956. After I Love Lucy ended its run in 1957, the main cast continued to appear in occasional hour-long specials under the title The Lucy Daisy Comedy Hour until 1960. Desilu produced several other popular shows, such as The Untouchables, Star Trek, and Mission, Impossible. The studio was eventually sold in 1967 for $17 million, $125 million in today's terms, and merged into Paramount Pictures. Topic: Activities 1960 to 1977. The 1960 Broadway musical Wildcat ended its run early when Ball became too ill to continue in the show. The show was the source of the song she made famous, Hey, Look Me Over, which she performed with Paula Stewart on The Ed Sullivan Show. Ball hosted a CBS radio talk show entitled Let's Talk to Lucy in 1964-65. She also made a few more movies including Yours, Mine, and Ours 1968, and The Musical Mame 1974, and two more successful long-running sitcoms for CBS, The Lucy Show 1962-68, which co-starred Vivian Vance and Gail Gordon, and Here's Lucy 1968-74, which also featured Gordon, as well as Lucy's real-life children, Lucy Arnez and Daisy Arnez Jr. She appeared on The Dick Cavett Show in 1974 and spoke of her history and life with Arnez. Ball's close friends in the business included perennial co star Vivian Vance and film stars Judy Garland, Ann Southern, and Ginger Rogers, and comedic television performers Jack Benny, Barbara Pepper, Mary Wicks, and Mary Jane Croft. All except Garland appeared at least once on her various series. Former Broadway co-stars Keith Andes and Paula Stewart also appeared at least once on her later sitcoms, as did Joan Blondell, Rich Little and Anne Margaret. Ball mentored actress and singer Carol Cook, and befriended Barbara Eden. When Eden appeared on an episode of I Love Lucy, in 1966, Ball became a friend and mentor to Carol Burnett. She guested on Burnett's highly successful CBS TV special Carol Plus Two and the younger performer reciprocated by appearing on The Lucy Show. It was rumored that Ball offered Burnett a chance to star on her own sitcom, but in truth Burnett was offered and declined. Here's Agnes by CBS executives. She instead chose to create her own variety show due to a stipulation that was on an existing contract she had with CBS. The two women remained close friends until Ball's death in 1989. Ball sent flowers every year on Burnett's birthday. When Burnett awoke on the day of her 56th birthday in 1989, she discovered via the morning news that Lucille Ball had died. Later that afternoon, Flowers arrived at Burnett's house with a note reading, Happy Birthday, Kid. Love, Lucy. Ball was originally considered by Frank Sinatra for the role of Mrs. Islin in the Cold War thriller The Manchurian Candidate. Director, producer John Frankenheimer, however, had worked with Angela Lansbury in a mother role in All Fall Down and insisted on having her for the part. Ball was the lead actress in a number of comedy television specials to about 1980, including Lucy Calls the President which featured Vivian Vance, Gail Gordon and Mary Jane Croft, and Lucy Moves to NBC, a special depicting a fictionalization of her move to the NBC television network. Topic. 1980s During the mid-1980s, Ball attempted to resurrect her television career. In 1982, she hosted a two-part Threes Company retrospective, showing clips from the show's first five seasons, summarizing memorable plotlines, and commenting on her love of the show, a 1985 dramatic made-for-TV film about an elderly homeless woman, Stone Pillow, received mixed reviews. Her 1986 sitcom Comeback Life with Lucy, co-starring her longtime foil Gail Gordon and co-produced by Ball, Gary Morton, and prolific producer, former actor Aaron Spelling was cancelled less than two months into its run by ABC. 
In February 1988, Ball was named the Hasty Pudding Woman of the Year. In May 1988, Ball was hospitalized after suffering a mild heart attack. Her last public appearance, just one month before her death, was at the 1989 Academy Awards telecast in which she and fellow presenter Bob Hope were given a standing ovation. Testimony before the House Committee on Un-American Activities When Ball registered to vote in 1936, she listed her party affiliation as communist. She was registered as a communist in 1938 as well. To sponsor the Communist Party's 1936 candidate for the California State Assembly's 57th District, Ball signed a certificate stating, I am registered as affiliated with the Communist Party. The same year, she was appointed to the State Central Committee of the Communist Party of California, according to records of the California Secretary of State. In 1937, Hollywood writer Rena Vale, a self-identified former communist, attended a Communist Party new members class at Ball's home. According to Vale's testimony before the United States House of Representatives Special House Un-American Activities Committee (HUAC) on July 22, 1940. Two years later, Vale affirmed this testimony in a sworn deposition. Within a few days after my third application to join the Communist Party was made, I received a notice to attend a meeting on North Ogden Drive, Hollywood, although it was a typed, unsigned note, merely requesting my presence at the address at 8 o'clock in the evening on a given day. I knew it was the long awaited notice to attend Communist Party new members' classes. On arrival at this address I found several others present, an elderly man informed us that we were the guests of the screen actress, Lucille Ball, and showed us various pictures, books, and other objects to establish that fact, and stated she was glad to loan her home for a Communist Party new members class. In a 1944 British Pathé newsreel, titled Fund Raising for Roosevelt, Ball was featured prominently among several stage and film stars at events in support of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's fundraising campaign for the March of Dimes. She stated that in the 1952 U.S. presidential election, she voted for Republican Dwight Eisenhower. On September 4, 1953, Ball met privately with HUAC investigator William A. Wheeler in Hollywood and gave him sealed testimony. She stated that she had registered to vote as a communist, or intended to vote the Communist Party ticket, in 1936 at her socialist grandfather's insistence. She stated she, at no time intended to vote as a communist. Ball stated she has never been a member of the Communist Party, to her knowledge. She did not know whether or not any meetings were ever held at her home at 1344 North Ogden Drive, stated, that if she had been appointed as a delegate to the State Central Committee of the Communist Party of California in 1936 it was done without her knowledge or consent, and stated that she did not recall signing the document sponsoring Emil Fried for the Communist Party nomination to the Office of Member of the Assembly for the 57th District. A review of the subject's file reflects no activity that would warrant her inclusion on the security index. Immediately before the filming of Episode 68, the girls go into business. Of I Love Lucy, Daisy Arnaz, instead of his usual audience warm-up, told the audience about Lucy and her grandfather. Reusing the line he had first given to Hedda Hopper in an interview, he quipped, the only thing read about Lucy is her hair, and even that is not legitimate. <laughs> Personal life Topic. Marriage, children, and divorce In 1940, Ball met Cuban-born bandleader Daisy Arnaz while filming the Rogers and Hart stage hit Too Many Girls. When they met again on the second day, the two connected immediately and eloped the same year. Although Arnaz was drafted into the Army in 1942, he ended up being classified for limited service due to a knee injury. As a result, Arnez stayed in Los Angeles, organizing and performing USO shows for wounded GIs being brought back from the Pacific. Ball filed for divorce in 1944, going so far as obtaining an interlocutory decree, however, she and Arnez reconciled, which precluded the entry of a final decree. On July 17, 1951, one month before her 40th birthday, Ball gave birth to daughter Lucy Desiree Arnez. 
A year and a half later, Ball gave birth to her second child, Dissiderio Alberto Arnez IV, known as Daisy Arnez Jr. Before he was born, I Love Lucy was a solid ratings hit, and Ball and Arnez wrote the pregnancy into the show. Ball's necessary and planned caserine section in real life was scheduled for the same date that her television character gave birth. Several demands were made by CBS, insisting that a pregnant woman could not be shown on television, nor could the word pregnant be spoken on air. After approval from several religious figures, the network allowed the pregnancy storyline, but insisted that the word expecting be used instead of pregnant. Arnez garnered laughs when he deliberately mispronounced it as Spectin. The episode's official title was Lucy is Ensente, borrowing the French word for pregnant. However, episode titles never appeared on the show. The episode aired on the evening of January 19, 1953, with 44 million viewers watching Lucy Ricardo welcome little Ricky, while in real life Ball delivered her second child, Daisy Jr., that same day in Los Angeles. The birth made the cover of the first issue of TV Guide for the week of April 3-9, 1953. In October 1956, Ball, Arnez, Vance, and William Frawley all appeared on a Bob Hope special on NBC, including a spoof of I Love Lucy, the only time all four stars were together on a color telecast. By the end of the 1950s, Desilu had become a large company, causing a good deal of stress for both Ball and Arnez. On March 3, 1960, a day after Desi's 43rd birthday and one day after the filming of Lucy and Desi's last episode together, Ball filed papers in Santa Monica Superior Court, claiming married life with Desi was a nightmare and nothing at all as it appeared on I Love Lucy. On May 4, 1960, just two months after filming that episode, the final episode of the Lucy Daisy Comedy Hour, the couple divorced. Until his death in 1986, however, Arnez and Ball remained friends and often spoke very fondly of each other. Her real-life divorce indirectly found its way into her later television series, as she was always cast as an unmarried woman. The following year, Ball starred in the Broadway musical Wildcat, which co-starred Keith Andes and Paula Stewart. It marked the beginning of a 30-year friendship between Lucy and Stewart, who introduced Lucy to second husband, Gary Morton, a borscht belt comic who was 13 years her junior. According to Ball, Morton claimed he had never seen an episode of I Love Lucy due to his hectic work schedule. Ball immediately installed Morton in her production company, teaching him the television business and eventually promoting him to producer. Morton played occasional bit parts on Ball's various series. Ball was outspoken against the relationship her son had with actress Patty Duke. Later, commenting on when her son dated Liza Minnelli, she was quoted as saying, I miss Liza, but you cannot domesticate Liza. Illness and death On April 18, 1989, Ball was at her home in Beverly Hills when she complained of chest pains. An ambulance was called and she was rushed to the emergency room of Cedars Sinai Medical Center. She was diagnosed with dissecting aortic aneurysm and underwent heart surgery for nearly eight hours, including the transplant of a new aorta. The surgery appeared to have been successful, and Ball began recovering very quickly, even walking around her room with little assistance. She received a flurry of get well wishes from Hollywood, and across the street from Cedars Sinai Medical Center, the Hard Rock Cafe erected a sign reading, Hard Rock Loves Lucy. However, shortly after dawn on April 26, Ball awoke with severe back pains and soon lost consciousness. Attempts to revive her failed, and her death was officially pronounced at 5 47 a.m. PDT doctors determined that Ball had succumbed to an abdominal aortic aneurysm and subsequent rupture, and that it was not directly related to her upper aneurysm and surgery the previous week. Cigarette smokers are known to have increased risk of abdominal aneurysm. Ball had been a heavy smoker most of her life. She was 77 years old, her body was cremated and the ashes were initially interred in Forest Lawn, Hollywood Hills Cemetery in Los Angeles. However, in 2002, her children moved her remains to the Hunt family plot at Lake View Cemetery in Jamestown, New York, where her parents, Henry and Desiree Hunt Ball, and her grandparents are buried. Topic: <laughs> Recognition and Legacy. 
On February 8, 1960, Ball was awarded two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one at 6436 Hollywood Boulevard for contributions to motion pictures, and one at 6100 Hollywood Boulevard for television. Ball received many prestigious awards throughout her career, including some posthumously such as the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George H. W. Bush on July 6, 1989, and the Women's International Center's Living Legacy Award, a Lucille Ball Day C. Arnez Center Museum is in Lucis' hometown of Jamestown, New York. The Little Theater was renamed the Lucille Ball Little Theater in her honor. Ball was among Time Magazine's 100 Most Important People of the Century. On June 7, 1990, Universal Studios Florida opened a walk-through attraction dedicated to Ball, Lucy, a tribute, which featured clips of shows, as well as various pieces of trivia about her, along with items owned by or associated with Lucille, and an interactive quiz for guests. The attraction was permanently closed on August 17, 2015. On August 6, 2001, which would have been her 90th birthday, the United States Postal Service honored her with a commemorative postage stamp as part of its Legends of Hollywood series. Ball appeared on the cover of TV Guide more than any other person. She appeared on 39 covers, including the first cover in 1953 with her baby son. Daisy Arnaz Jr. TV Guide voted Lucille Ball as the greatest TV star of all time, and it later commemorated the 50th anniversary of I Love Lucy with eight collector covers celebrating memorable scenes from the show. In another instance it named I Love Lucy the second best television program in American history, after Seinfeld, due to her support for the women's movement, Ball was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 2001. The Friars Club named a room in its New York clubhouse for Lucille Ball, the Lucille Ball Room. She was posthumously awarded the Legacy of Laughter Award at the 5th Annual TV Land Awards in 2007. In November 2007, Lucille Ball was chosen as number two on a list of the 50 Greatest TV Icons. A public poll, however, chose her as number one. On August 6, 2011, which would have been her 100th birthday, Google honored Ball with an interactive doodle on their homepage, which displayed six classic moments from I Love Lucy. On the same day, a total of 915 ball look-alikes converged on Jamestown to celebrate the birthday and set a new world record for such a gathering. Since 2009, a statue of ball has been on display in Celeron, New York. Residents deemed that statue scary and not accurate, earning it the nickname Scary Lucy. On August 1, 2016, it was announced that a new statue of ball would replace it. The new statue replaced the old one on August 6, 2016. However, since the old statue became a local tourist attraction after receiving media attention, it was placed 75 yards from its original location so visitors could visit both statues. In 2015, it was announced that Ball would be played by Kate Blanchett in an untitled biographical film, to be written by Aaron Sorkin. Ball was portrayed by Gillian Anderson, as her character Lucy Ricardo, in the American Gods episode, The Secret of Spoons. 2017, Ball was portrayed by Sarah Drew in I Love Lucy. A funny thing happened on the way to the sitcom, a comedy about how Ball and her husband battled to get their sitcom on the air. It had its world premiere in Los Angeles on July 12, 2018, co-starring Oscar Nunez as Daisy Arnaz, and Seamus Dever as I Love Lucy creator-producer head writer Jess Oppenheimer. The play, written by Jess Oppenheimer's son, Greg Oppenheimer, was recorded in front of a live audience for nationwide public radio broadcast and online distribution. <laughs> Filmography and television work <laughs> Radio appearances equals equals see also